Hello, Steve Snodgrass here. Yes, I am still acting president of the Omaha UFO Study Group. Despite the title of this presentation, given at the 2013 UNO UFO Symposium in Omaha, Nebraska. Yes, no sooner than I arrived on the scene from a 20-year hiatus from any interest in the subject of UFOs and ETs whatsoever, have I arrived with this presentation entitled, The End of Ufology. After two years of research, I have come to share this message. The end is near, folks. Now, does that mean this? Or this? Or should I really don my tinfoil hat and start carrying around a large hand-painted whiteboard sign saying, The end is near? Well, here's a question. If this is the end of ufology, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I started my work on this topic in 2010 with a white paper entitled A Report on Ancient Aliens, Psychic Phenomena, and a Suggested Phenomenological Approach to Ufology. This was followed by Phoning Home, Ufology and the Evolution of Consciousness. Then came my signature work, a trilogy of papers and an eight-part YouTube video PowerPoint on what I call integral ufology, outlining what I still believe shows some promise in revolutionizing the way UFO ET cases can be validated, even including one of the most bizarre cases offered by the work of John Foster in his books Eminent Discovery and To Earth from Heaven, of which I am a chief investigator on his case. Here's the website if you're interested in looking uh, into this case further. Well, my most recent effort was a PowerPoint presentation exclusive to YouTube and to our website called The UFO ET Hypothesis, Pseudoscience or Plausible, which was the result of getting irritated by inane skeptics like Michael Shermer. Here I argued a clear and convincing case that rational human beings driven by the essential features of the scientific method and logic ought to hold as valid the UFO ET hypothesis, which is stated as some, underlined some, unidentified flying objects are best explained as being extraterrestrial or non-human life from other planets occupying physical spacecraft visiting Earth. I tried to demonstrate that this hypothesis is valid, supported by logical inference, and is clear and convincing, despite the fact that neither I nor anyone else has habeas corpus ET. So during the winter of 2013, I've been witness to, to, to statistics about declining membership in UFO study groups, especially in the UK occasionally subjecting myself to the unbearable innuendo of Ancient Aliens, the series, and then watching it get debunked. And surely, if all we're left with are historical, anachronistic speculations that are only subject to a trimming with Occam's razor, you know, conspiracy theories, numerous ongoing hoaxes and pranks, and the occasional light in the sky, this is spelling the end of ufology, isn't it? You know, if the only alternative left is to hit the psilocybin mushrooms, uh, go down to Peru and get some ayahuasca brew uh, via administered dimethyltryptamine or DMT, or maybe at this point move to Colorado, you know, sorry, I'm out. And yet, at the same time, we have been watching the formulation of international efforts to gather scientific minds from around the world most notably the, wor the work of the French and their Académie de Ufologie. Sorry if I mispronounced it, my French brethren. We are watching exciting advances in cognitive neuroscience, philosophy of mind, the emergence of species and evolution, and breathtaking discoveries of new theories of cosmology, as well as Dave Paris and Matt Judah's laboratory experiments on space warp that suggest interstellar travel may very well be quite possible. I have recently been hooked on the work of physicist Roger Penrose and biologist Rupert Sheldrake. Any number of guests on the Brain Science podcast and guys on the Partially Examined Life Philosophy podcast to explore the implications of the UFO ET hypothesis. 
So perhaps, I guess in my mind, it's too soon to call the coroner on ufology. But you didn't land here to hear me talk about what I've done already. You're here for something new, right? Well, on February 15th, 2013, I verbally committed to present at this year's 2013 UNO UFO Symposium. And I'd like to tell you a story. It's a story about what happened in the subsequent week that brought me to this presentation and its title, The End of Ufology. So this is a meta-presentation, a presentation describing the development of this presentation. Well, that night on the radio show, for some reason, I had wanted to talk about the topic of deja vu. How in the world can that work? How can it be? If I believe that life is not predetermined, that is, I have free will, how can I reconcile that with the very few but powerful occasions of deja vu I have experienced that have left me speechless? There have been brief moments, usually no longer than five to ten seconds, that I know for a fact I was in the very same situation before. It all played out the same way. Some things were different, but the content of the thought and the experience around me in a deja vu was an unmistakable encounter or brush with something truly unexplainable and impossible to comprehend. Well, we didn't end up talking about deja vu that night on the radio show, but after committing to present at the symposium that night, here's what happened to me. This is my story. I started to form some goals in my mind. Now, I knew I didn't want to go backward and talk about Michael Shermer again. I wanted to do something new, something creative. Or, as Dave Bowman told the HAL 9000 in the film 2010, something wonderful. I thought about how cool it would be for me to levitate in front of any, everyone. Now, that would put some juice into the symposium, wouldn't it? But, alas, I have had no luck in the area of levitation. So, I settled on another side goal. To do something truly embarrassing. I wanted to pretend like I really understood the real mysteries and the complicated fields of cosmology, quantum mechanics, protobiology, and cognitive neuroscience. I wanted to see some eye-rolling and cause some severe neck trauma related to the head-shaking from everyone in the audience as I tried to unlock the secrets of the universe in less than an hour. Here's the idea, basically. I thought, until we understand these things, then we won't really be in a position to understand these things. So, for what it's worth, this is what I was hoping to accomplish. Simple as that. Just simply understand the nature of matter, life, and consciousness in the universe, and then maybe we can talk about how UFOs and ETs fit in. Fair enough? Well, day two. I was busy all day Saturday, but I spent that night looking at different YouTube videos of Rupert Sheldrake. I have been intrigued by his research into morphogenesis, that is, what gives rise to form. Sheldrake is an English biochemist and his theory of morphic fields and morphic resonance are an attempt to explain animal and plant development and behavior, memory, telepathy, perception, and cognition in general. The gist of the idea is that memory is stored in morphic fields that influence and are influenced by living things. Living things have morphic fields that operate by morphic resonance, which are enacted by their degree of similarity leading to the persistence of habits. It's often referred to as a pseudoscience, and I know Professor Perez in our group does not like the idea at all, probably because it's another one of those things that can't be seen and doesn't lend itself to scientific experiments that easily. But to me, it explains in a very coherent way how life forms self-organize into more complexity and seem to do so across great distances, where normal forms of communication and genetic inheritance are impossible. The apparently discredited so-called urban legend of the 100th monkey effect, where monkeys on one continent learn how to wash food after 100 monkeys on another continent learn how to do it, are an explanation of morphic resonance. Parallel evolution and replicated studies of how rats learn water mazes are some of the evidence Rupert Sheldrake cites as well. You know, a rat can find its way through a body of water, as we're trying to drown the poor thing, to find a platform that will keep them from drowning. 
Well, somehow other rats learn these mazes more quickly after other non-related rats have already done it. So in other words, genes and environment explain a lot about why things behave the way they do, but not everything. To me, morphic resonance explains the rest quite nicely. Stay tuned for part two.